I have this title that's kind of a, a mashup of things that I'm interested in, and it'll be a little bit easier to explain the title if we go here. So um, this is a little tongue in cheek, but um, really, uh, I, I think to deal with our climate and energy problem, we really have to, to embrace uh, CO2. And I'm going to kind of have a, a two parts, maybe three parts to my talk. This is not pointing. Um, the first thing is there's actually some really interesting and I think good news that people really don't know about. Uh, and, and I'm going to show you that. Um, and then uh, to make a little bit of a transition, talk a little bit about uh, perhaps the potential availability of CO2. And then I want to do, you know, get a little bit uh, geeky and talk a little bit about my own research. So uh, hydraulic fracturing, um, a word probably everybody's heard, um, maybe, and maybe you think you understand it, but it's, it's, it's uh, interesting and complicated. And uh, the aspect ratio here is about right. You would typically, to access these deep shale resources, you might drill down 6,000, 7,000 feet. And then uh, there's a horizontal well bore. Um, and fluids are injected at high pressure. And you know the, the thing that you see in the common media about um, breaking the rocks up into little pieces is not entirely true. Uh, what sort of happens is, in, in most cases is that there are pre-existing defects in the rock. And you get a little bit of slip on the rock. And that creates a pathway for fluids to flow. What's really um, important here is uh, this thing that says cemented well casing, because you see that the aquifer is very far away from what people refer to as the target. And um, having a good seal against the aquifer is what prevents uh, that aquifer from being polluted. Uh, it's virtually impossible, although it's physically possible, but it's virtually impossible to, for one of these fractures to grow all the way up. Um, so the the main contamination path is up the, up the, the hole that was drilled. So uh, this, in fact, is what a uh, uh, hydraulically fractured uh, system sort of looks like. And the different colors are so-called different stages. And so in this long horizontal well bore, they did, you know, they tried to hydraulically fracture here and here and here. And what you see in terms of the, the little, um, dots are where they located one of these uh, positions where the, the rocks slipped a little bit. So um, what's pretty interesting about uh, the shale boom is that there's something in this for the, everybody in the economy. So on the top bullet, right, that's you know, sort of the top 1%. Um, but there's been a measurable uh, impact on what people pay for energy, as well as in GDP growth. So this sector of the economy has outperformed uh, uh, relative to its, uh, its size of the economy. So pretty interesting uh, the, uh, in terms of the economics. Um, climate impacts are a little more debated. And I want to talk about that uh, a little bit. And to do that, I'm going to show you um, first, this figure on the right. So this is the production rate of coal in the US versus time. And so these are annual averages. And you can see there's maybe three um, peaks. Uh, this, this peak that's the latest one, that's about 2008, actually corresponds with the onset of um, a lot of availability of natural gas. So. Um, we can try to actually model this and see the effect. So we'll use a uh, logistic model. So you probably all at least heard of the idea of peak oil, right? So this guy, King Hubbard, uh, tried to predict uh, future oil. So N is the cumulative production, right? So if we summed up all of that production rate, that would be the cumulative rate. Uh, the cumulative, the rate is dN dt, OK? And then um, R is the rate of change. So it would determine you know, how big your bell curve is. So there's multiple peaks in that. So we have to use a multi-cycle model. Um, so it looks sort of like this. So again, so this is rate. 
And then each uh, little peak is sort of modeled, so we would sum them up over how many that we need. And um, we actually do this as a, an exercise in, uh, in one of the undergraduate classes that I teach, because it's a nice way of talking about modeling. Um, you know, all models are wrong, some are useful. Um, so again, this is the data, rate versus year, okay? Um, and here in this solid line, uh, this solid gray line is my fit to the data. In this red dashed line is the trend that we were on prior to the onset of uh, availability of natural gas from hydraulic fracturing. So um, the coal that's not going to be mined in the US is pretty substantial. And you can see you know, we're on this path. Uh, and it looks pretty good. So that's all that hole in between there. So we can try and understand how much uh, CO2 that might be. Um, but that coal isn't, well, that electricity from that coal isn't just going away, right? We're replacing it with other things. And so the US has mostly been on a path where uh, the replacement is about half renewable and half natural gas, OK? So on the right is cumulative productions in uh, gigatons of CO2 versus year. Um, blue is the path that the US is on, right? So we're on this blue path. If we look out uh, about uh, 50 years, you know, this is an excess of 100 gigatons of CO2. Has anybody heard of the idea of like wedges, carbon wedges? No one's, a few people are shaking your heads, yeah. but. 100 gigatons of CO2 is roughly a carbon wedge. It's a little bit less. And um, so it's an idea from two guys at Princeton, uh, Rob Sokolow and Stephen Pakala. Uh, but the idea is right that you look around for things that you can do in energy. And uh, a wedge is a lot, 100, roughly 100 gigatons of CO2. It's actually 92. And if you can do about 10 of these things, basically you've addressed the climate and energy problem. right? So, this is just by, in the US, we're on a pathway uh, to take care of about 10% uh, of the problem. Uh, this thing dashed in green is the same 50-50, but if we captured the carbon, uh, well, if we captured 90% of the carbon from the combustion of the natural gas. So you can see that it's substantial, but most of the, you know, it's a substantial difference, right? But most of the benefit is really this switch to natural gas and, and renewables. Uh, and again, this is a pretty um, amazing thing and something that uh, you know, we don't really talk about very much. Uh, a couple other thoughts, uh, just sort of quickly. Um, the, uh, one of the really interesting things about natural gas and renewables is that they work together very well for electricity. So this is a plot. Uh, basically, hour in the day um, for some typical spring day in California, and this is megawatts of uh, electricity. And the yellow and the orange in the top you see, those are contributions from uh, wind and solar. Clearly, the sun goes down uh, even in California every day, right? Um, and so what happens when that solar goes away? California has very little storage of electricity at the moment. And you can see what happens is that natural gas, which is this navy blue and that sort of pale blue, uh, they ramp up, OK? Um, and, uh, and it offsets for the, um, um, you know, offsets for basically the setting of the sun. And estimates are that over time, that renewable portion that you see is going to get sort of even deeper and deeper during the day. And then something's going to have to make up for it at, uh, at night. So, so far, natural gas renewables are working together quite well. Um, and here is perhaps the surprising thing that uh, you may not be aware of. So this is uh, not carbon emissions from the entire US. This is carbon emissions from electricity generation in the US, and it's all emissions with everything converted to CO2 equivalents. OK? So we are here on this side, 2018 uh, was the last number on this chart. And we are down to sort of 
uh, late 80s level for uh, emissions from uh, electricity in the US, right? So the gross amount is down as well as the per capita, right? Because over this time, US population's gone up by 40 or 50 million people, something like that. Um, so pretty, you know, pretty amazing. Um, you know, this, as I, you know, if you think about the idea of wedges, you know, there is not a single solution. There's a bunch of activities that we need to do. Um, this looks like a pretty, um, you know, interesting trend that hopefully we can continue to um, reduce uh, emissions sort of year over year. Um, I won't talk about it, but you can think about, you know, other countries in the world that emit a lot of CO2, such as China. China, in fact, has uh, natural gas resources in shale that are larger than those in the U.S. Um, so there's a potential pathway to um, sort of export this uh, idea to other places. Um, and uh, just one other, I won't go into this in a lot of detail, but there's a really interesting um, power plant uh, that's running in Texas. Uh, and it runs off of natural gas, um, but it doesn't take in air. Uh, it takes in pure oxygen, and it actually burns that natural gas in an excess of CO2. And so what's interesting about this uh, is that it basically, you have to bleed some CO2 out of this system because um, it's going to accumulate because you're burning natural gas. But the, the CO2 that comes out is actually ready for industrial use of some uh, sort. And it, so it sort of solves the problem of, um, of carbon capture, okay? So again, this is a pilot plant, promised zero air emissions, uh, same cost or less compared to conventional uh, natural gas fired electricity. And the other kind of thing that's uh, interesting about this as well is that it makes a fair amount of clean water because um, if you think about methane, right, it's carbon and it's hydrogen. So water is also a, a product that's got to come out. Okay, so um, what might we do with CO2? Um, well, we might go and think about if we can use this beneficially in uh, another, you know, problem that we have. I'll, sk I'll just skip this in the interest of time. and We'll just focus on water. So these are different places uh, where uh, natural gas is produced in North America by hydraulic fracturing. Uh, that's how much water it takes to complete a well, so millions of gallons. Um, so four, millions of gal four million gallons of water is uh, a lot of water. So it's about the average daily consumption of 11,000 uh, families. And uh, water reuse and water management is a problem uh, faced by the, by the industry. Um, and so why do they use water to hydraulically fracture? Well, it's because it's available, it's easy to use, it's there. Um, so what we might do is actually instead of using water, we could use um, carbon dioxide for hydraulic fracturing. Um, there are a lot of other questions about that, like does it flow back? What does it do to the rock? Um, how does it flow? Um, all of those questions and many others really um, can be answered uh, in a much more holistic way if we have sort of fundamental knowledge of, of how fluids move through shale. Um, and so, in fact, that's uh, some of us on uh, campus are part of a, what the Department of Energy calls an Energy Frontier Research Center. That's the name of ours there. Um, but it's really about uh, trying to decrease uh, the impacts of uh, hydraulic fracturing uh, on the environment, right? So there's a lot of upside uh, in terms of carbon emissions, and uh, there's, well, there's a lot of downsides uh, due to uh, water use uh, as well as material and energy demands, and um, a more fundamental understanding uh, could benefit that. So our, our center is kind of organized in three ways at sort of the core, and that most of my work here is characterization. So what does shale actually look like? How do fluids flow? Um, there are, as a multi-physics perspective, so transport, um, mechanics, and reactivity, because these, these rocks actually uh, react. And then over the top, 
uh, is what's called scale translation. So shale pores on the order of nanometers, right? And uh, well spacings are on the orders of kilometers. Um, so there's a big difference in scale there. Um, so um, I wanted with my maybe last 10 minutes and let's try and save a few minutes for questions. I want to show you a few things uh, that we do uh, in my laboratory. And we do a lot of imaging uh, with uh, computed tomography. And so this cartoon here uh, gives you an idea. So there's an x-ray source. And the source is moving. Um, or the material you're looking at could be moving. Um, and so there's multiple uh, passes of uh, a beam of x-rays through the same volumetric um, part of the sample. And uh, it's possible to do a tomographic reconstruction. And what that would mean would be for, say, that yellow square. It's, in fact, it's a cube um, or a cuboid. Uh, you could go in that cuboid and understand how much uh, x-rays were attenuated. Um, so one way of, of actually processing this data is with a so-called CT number. And there's a bunch of equations here. What really I want you to, to look at is here on the bottom. So a conventional way that people look at CT images is they just look at the plain image. Uh, and then they do, uh, you know, they play with like the gray levels and you try and differentiate things that way. So we do that in my group. But what we really like to do is our fluid substitution experiments, right? So you can have a sample with, say, no fluid in it. You can put a fluid in it. And then you can do a calculation like this, where you subtract those images of fluid filled and not fluid filled, and then you normalize it. And then you actually have an understanding of, of where um, fluids actually move in your sample, which is important when you have something like shale. So this is just some data. So a good penetrant for uh, a sample like this shale is a gas, because gases flow um, very easily. They're much less viscous. Uh, the two that we use a lot of are krypton and, um, and uh, CO2. So what's relevant here is that uh, air or vacuum would have a CT number about minus 1,000. So we actually have a difference with CO2 um, as well as krypton. So we can actually image where fluids flow. And that's what the next one shows you. So this is that sample after we've done our experiment and done all of our image analysis. Um, and what is happening is that um, time is going on as we go from left to right. And red is more CO2 and blue is no CO2. And so we can actually see this sample uh, filling up with, uh, with carbon dioxide. So an interesting fact uh, is that um, the density of CO2 at any pressure and temperature is always greater than the density of methane. So practically, you can take the methane out of the resource, combust it, or extract the energy, and put the CO2 back in and have a little bit of room to spare. So this is a nice sample. It accepts uh, CO2. Um, uh, one of the things that we tried to do is actually go down in scale and understand what it is about, say, this sample that makes it accept CO2 versus other samples that don't. So on the top, we have that 3D image. okay, And it's at a certain resolution. We can spin it around. We can slice it and dice it on the computer. We can come to a cross section like this, which is interesting because it has blue where no CO2 entered. And then it has red where a lot of CO2 entered. We can go take that sample and sample it destructively. So cut it, okay, polish it. And then um, look at it under a scanning electron microscope. And these are truly multi-scale images, because I can look at this region here. Here it is in a larger, um, uh, you know, more magnified. Uh, in this square, this region actually looks particularly interesting. So we can zoom on that. And in this image, there's a bunch of stuff. What do we see? Well, we see what looks like spaces to us in the fabric of the shale. Uh, this thing called OM is organic matter. Uh, so it's something carbonaceous. We can actually zoom that in. 
and we get this image here, for example. And what the black is are the, actually the pores of size about five to 10 nanometers uh, inside this organic matter, okay? Um, and so we can understand, again, why, you know, gases can move around, what makes them good candidates for CO2. We have a whole sort of library of these uh, images um, that I could bore you with for hours talking about the textural details, um, but we can sort of sort those things out. Um, this is destructive though, right? I have to cut the sample. Um, so what we would like to do is actually not destroy our sample. Uh, so we have a, 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 not a new area, but an interesting area. Um, and so what this is, is a piece of a shale sample that's been milled and we're actually going to look at that little thing on the top that says 30 uh, microns. And we're going to do that up at uh, SLAC. Uh, they have something called a transmission X-ray microscope, otherwise known as a nano CT. So it has um, a sort of resolution of 30 nanometers. Okay? So those images that we were looking at previously, uh, this image here has a resolution of a couple hundred. Uh, microns, right, and these have images, you know, on the order, of, these have resolution on the order of nanometers, okay? But so we have a 3D volumetric um, image. Um, this will spin around and do a bunch of really cool stuff, but I won't do it. Uh, but, we, you know, we can have an image like this, which is an image of the top, and we can see different minerals and, uh, and different things uh, in it. Um, but again, the issue here is an issue of resolution, okay? So this is one of those little pillars on the top of our sample. Uh, and then we'd, act, we'd actually like to image this and have high resolution information, but we don't want to destroy it because we'd like to do an experiment on it. Uh, in the middle here uh, is an image, is a, is a nano CT image, okay? And this is an SEM image at almost the same location. So to get this image on the right, we actually did destroy our sample, okay? And you can just see visually, you know, they look sort of similar, but this one's a lot less, you know, has a lot less kind of information in it. Um, you can look at this region right here. And so, yeah, there's a region here, but you can look in this SEM image and there's a lot more detail, right? And these little uh, details are something that we're, that we're interested in. So what are we, what would, what we're trying to do um, is actually get super resolution uh, on these TXM images by using information from the SEM. Okay, so here's an example. Here's a part of a TXM image, and again, you can that's the nano CT. Again, um, not you know not destructive. Okay, here's the actual SEM from the same location. A lot more information. So we use. Um, a lot of the same AI tools that, that people use for other things, but we use them for image analysis. And these images on the right that look like uh, this SEM image are actually this image, um, only, they've been, only they've been sort of corrected. And so now we have super resolution. Okay, so um, we had to do this. We had to destroy the sample, but we only destroyed this part of the sample, leaving the rest of this, right? So, we have TXM Im image data on the rest of this part of the sample, and so we have super resolution in, the, in 3D, okay? So we do, uh, you know, uh, convolutional neural networks and generative adversarial networks. Um, again, just like a lot of people are using for a lot of different applications. Um, so that's the end. I hope I left five minutes for questions. Um, so uh, kind of the take home points are that, um, this switch from coal to renewables and gas um, so far has had a, uh, a pretty positive impact on um, long-term CO2 emissions. Again, this is something that you won't hear uh, much about. Um, the storage capacity in shales uh, for CO2 is, is pretty good. Um, and uh, this sort of this multimodal imaging uh, so using the TXM and using SEM 
uh, combined with you know these these AI techniques seems pretty promising um, for getting uh, uh, super resolution so we don't have to destroy our samples to understand everything. So just a couple slides to finish up. Uh, this is the work of uh, these people, uh, some of whom are still in my research group, some of who have graduated and left. Um, uh, you know, if you're looking for energy courses, I encourage you to look at uh, energy resources engineering. We have a full uh, set of classes that go from renewables um, to uh, petroleum engineering. And um, that's my acknowledgement, and I will stop there and see if you have any questions or comments. Yes. Um, my name is Boris. I am with ICME, but I have a question about the so the 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 shale gas development. They reduce CO two long term, and that's great. Uh, but from what I read in the Economist, so not not a scientific publication. Uh, when the companies try to reduce their water use um, for fr fracking and, and they start using chemicals, which are first, well, they don't use water, and second, they are more effective in, in cracking the uh, shale formations. But at the same time, they introduce like cancerogenic stuff into the, into the soil, into the groundwater, that kind of stuff. So the impact on the environment is reduced uh, via CO2 reductions, but increase via health to humans. What is, um, when, when you all study this, like do you, do you have to at the same time do the research of the other side, or is that left for somebody else to measure? What's, what's the interaction between those? Okay, I'm not sure what the other side is, right? But there, the are, people, being the, there the, are people looking at all the impact aspect, to health. Yeah, all aspects, yeah. Um, so a couple things. Um, yeah, so first of all, like in terms of the chemicals that they put in, yeah, they do, they are as a sort of a cocktail of chemicals. Uh, that's regulated state by states, but most states now have a law that people have to document what they're putting in, so at least we know what's going in. Um, but generally, right, you're, you're injecting something into what's already a toxic waste dump anyway. It's effectively nature made a toxic waste dump, right, because the hydrocarbons that are in there are cancerous themselves. However, I, I, one of the things that's very misleading in the media is, is this idea of groundwater contamination. Um, so as far as I know, uh, there are very few cases of hydraulic fracturing contributing to groundwater contamination because they're so far apart. Okay, so when there is a problem, what it is, um, is it goes back to people haven't made sure that there's a good seal between their well bore when they pass anything uh, that's drinking water. Okay? And a lot of what people say is contamination is coming from old wells where someone else may have abandoned it or something. So this is a slide that, um, from this reference. And the top are the deepest aquifers across the Marcellus Basin. Um, and I guess we're going, I don't know, remember which way it's going, but it's going geographically in some area. And then this is a bunch of information about the wells at those locations, but the blue is the top of whatever they did, right? So you still have thousands of feet um, between where your operation is and the aquifer. So again, if there's going to be contamination, it's really uh, from this operation. It's going to be that somehow when you passed the, uh, the aquifer part, uh, you didn't have a good seal between the well casing and the, um, and the formation. And what's ironic is that most, so that this is one of the easier things for people to measure. Um, and, but ironically, it's something that's often not measured. So a lot of states are, are sort of asking that people make sure that they have a better seal. Um, so it's a long answer to a complicated question. Um, but we do, th yeah, we do think about everything. Um, 
and definitely on campus. Um, so like in my center, we're really focused on this problem of water substitution and understanding in the reservoir, you know, the effects of water. Uh, but there are other people that are worried about methane leakage and the other people worried about um, more sh shallow groundwater effects, yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, I just also wanted to point out that, that um, I think that the defense that not much has been uh, discovered yet is not a good defense because maybe there were not enough measurements. Maybe, uh, I mean, lobbying is a thing in the U.S. and they tend to bend the, the facts. Yeah, uh, I don't know if I said much discovered. I mean, th th as far, I was saying as far as I know, there are very few cases where, you know, this operation affected that, right? But there, there are definitely problems of aquifer contamination. Those are mostly due to older wells that leak. Yeah, um, and things that people didn't know about, or they just didn't know about, yeah. Um, so definitely, yeah, there are issues, but they don't seem to be coming from this problem. So that's the end of my time. Um, I'm easy to find uh, on campus, so I will turn it over. Right? 